The telephone cable linking the flagship with the shore hummed with a constant stream of messages as the fleet headquarters maintained close liaison with the naval general staff in Tokyo and made arrangements with the Kur naval base for ship repairs, maintenance and supply. Vice Admiral Nagumo and Vice Admiral Kondo, neither of whom had previously been consulted regarding the midway operation, now had their first opportunity to study the combined fleet plan. So far as the first air fleet commander and his staff were concerned, the reaction was almost one of indifference. They seemed to care little where the next operation was directed. The Nagumo force had run up a brilliant record of achievement in the first phase operations, and the headquarters was fully confident of its ability to carry out any mission which combined fleet assigned. Beneath the headquarters level, the reception was more enthusiastic. Rear Admiral Taman Yamaguchi, Commander Carrier Division 2, had for a time advocated that the next operation be aimed at Ceylon with a view to the eventual extension of Japanese control over the whole Indian Ocean area. However, after learning of the Midway plan, he became one of its staunchest supporters. From the outset of the war, Yamaguchi, who had once served as naval attaché in Washington, had fervently believed that the United States fleet must be challenged in decisive battle at the earliest opportunity. Since this was one of the central objectives of the Midway operation, it naturally won his complete approval. As for the flying officers of the Nagumo force, they had every reason to welcome the Midway venture, for to them it meant a chance to destroy the American carrier force, which they regarded as their special foe. The attitude of Vice Admiral Kondo and his staff, however, was quite different. On the 1st of May, the Second Fleet Commander boarded Yamato for his first meeting with Admiral Yamamoto since the start of the war. After a brief discussion of the first phase operations, the conversation turned to the midway plan. Vice Admiral Kondo frankly voiced misgivings, emphasising in particular that the assault on midway would have to be carried out without shore-based air support while the enemy would be able to employ not only substantial shore-based air strength, but also carrier forces which as yet had not been seriously damaged. Because of this grave disadvantage, he argued that it would be wiser to launch invasion operations against New Caledonia in order to sever the supply line between the United States and Australia. Admiral Yamamoto, however, brushed aside Kondo's objections with the assertion that the Midway plan had been agreed upon between combined fleet headquarters and the naval general staff after careful study on both sides, and could not be changed. He added that in spite of the risks involved in the Midway operation, there was no reason to fear defeat if surprise were successfully achieved. Vice Admiral Kondo then turned to the combined fleet chief of staff, Rear Admiral Ugaki, and asked if the fleet headquarters was not concerned over the difficulty of keeping Midway supplied after its capture. Unless this could be done, he asserted, its occupation would be pointless. To this, Ugaki's far from reassuring reply was that if it eventually became impossible to continue supplying the occupation forces, they could be evacuated after completely destroying military installations. With this, the discussion ended. It was quite apparent that Combined Fleet Headquarters, regardless of all objections, had no intention of backing down from its decision to carry out the Midway operation. After returning to his own flagship, Vice Admiral Kondo related the substance of his talks in Yamato to his Chief of Staff, Rear Admiral Kazutaka Shiraishi, and Senior Staff Officer, Captain Kuranosuke Yanagizawa. Yanagizawa regretfully remarked that at the very least he would like to see the staging point for the Midway invasion forces changed from Saipan to Truk in order to lessen the danger of premature enemy discovery. Second Fleet representatives later pressed this proposal during the Combined Fleet briefing conferences on the Midway plan, but to no avail. Combined Fleet was not in the mood to accept even minor changes. On the same day that Vice Admiral Kondo communicated his doubts concerning the Midway venture to Admiral Yamamoto, Combined Fleet Headquarters initiated a four-day series of war games designed to test various operations already planned or tentatively contemplated for the second phase of the war. Staged on board flagship Yamato, under the direction of Combined Fleet Chief of Staff Rear Admiral Ugaki, the games were attended by a majority of the commanders and staff officers of the forces which were to take part in the midway operation. Those who had returned only a short while earlier from the southern area were conspicuous by the deep tan of their complexions, 
a result of six months spent under the tropic sun. Their eyes sparkled with excitement as they assembled to study the roles they would play in the forthcoming operations. The invasion of Midway was the starting point of the games, but it was only the beginning. Not since the war games of November 1941, which had rehearsed the Pearl Harbor attack and the southern invasions, had such a grandiose program of offensive operations been tested. The overall hypothetical plan formulated by Combined Fleet Headquarters as a basis for the Games was briefly as follows. In early June, the main strength of Combined Fleet will capture Midway, and a part of its strength will seize the Western Aleutians. After completion of these operations, most of the battleship strength will return to the homeland and stand by, while the remainder of the Midway Invasion naval forces will assemble at Truk to resume operations early in July for the capture of strategic points in New Caledonia and the Fiji Islands. The Nagumo force will then carry out airstrikes against Sydney and other points on the southeast coast of Australia. Following the above, the Nagumo force and other forces assigned to the New Caledonia-Fiji Islands operations will reassemble at Truk for replenishment. Sometime after the beginning of August, Operations will be launched against Johnston Island and Hawaii, employing the full strength of Combined Fleet. Except for the staff of Combined Fleet Headquarters, all those taking part in the war games were amazed at this formidable programme, which seemed to have been dreamed up with a great deal more imagination than regard for reality. Still more amazing, however, was the manner in which every operation from the invasion of Midway and the Aleutians down to the assault on Johnston and Hawaii was carried out in the games without the slightest difficulty. This was due in no small measure to the high-handed conduct of Rear Admiral Ugaki, the presiding officer, who frequently intervened to set aside rulings made by the umpires. In the tabletop manoeuvres, for example, a situation developed in which the Nagumo force underwent a bombing attack by enemy land-based aircraft while its own planes were off attacking Midway. In accordance with the rules, Lieutenant Commander Okumiya, Carrier Division 4 Staff Officer who was acting as an umpire, cast dice to determine the bombing results and ruled that there had been nine enemy hits on the Japanese carriers. Both Akagi and Kaga were listed as sunk. Admiral Ugaki, however, arbitrarily reduced the number of enemy hits to only three, which resulted in Kaga's still being ruled sunk, but Akagi only slightly damaged. To Okumiya's surprise, even this revised ruling was subsequently cancelled, and Kaga reappeared as a participant in the next part of the games covering the New Caledonia and Fiji Islands invasions. The verdicts of the umpires regarding the results of airfighting were similarly juggled, always in favour of the Japanese forces. The value of the games also was impaired by the fact that the participating staff officers from several major operational commands, including the Nagumo Force and the shore-based 11th Air Fleet, had had little time to study the operations to be tested. The result was that they could only play out their parts like puppets, with the staff of combined fleet headquarters pulling the strings. The lack of preparation was illustrated by an incident which occurred during the Midway invasion manoeuvres. There, the somewhat reckless manner in which the Nagumo force operated evoked criticism, and the question was raised as to what plan the force had in mind to meet the contingency that an enemy carrier task force might appear on its flank while it was executing its scheduled air attack on Midway. The reply given by the Nagumo force staff officer present was so vague as to suggest that there was no such plan, and Rear Admiral Ugaki himself cautioned that greater consideration must be given to this possibility. Indeed, in the actual battle, this was precisely what happened. Following the conclusion of the war games on the 4th of May, two additional days were devoted to study and briefing conferences concerning the Midway operation. Various recommendations were advanced for making changes in the operational plan, but for the most part they got nowhere. In particular, almost all the participating fleet commanders from Vice Admiral Kondo on down the Una strongly urged postponement of the invasion date in order to allow more time for battle preparations, Rear Admiral Ugaki, however, asserted that this was impossible because a postponement, unless it were for an entire month, would mean that there would be inadequate moonlight for night manoeuvring off the invasion beaches. One problem raised by the staff of the Nagumo force was the inadequacy of the radio communications equipment carried by flagship Akagi.
This, of course, was a weakness common to all carriers because of the necessity of keeping the radio masts small and unobtrusive so as not to interfere with the takeoff and landing of aircraft. Rear Admiral Kusaka, Chief of Staff of the Nagumo Force, pointed out during the study conferences that Akagi might fail to intercept enemy radio messages vitally important to forming an estimate of enemy movements and intentions. To remedy this, two alternatives were recommended. The first was that Admiral Yamamoto's flagship Yamato, instead of leading the battleship main strength, which would necessitate maintaining radio silence, should operate independently and relay all important radio intercepts to the Nagumo force. The second provided that Yamato should operate directly with the carriers, Admiral Yamamoto assuming direct command of the Nagumo force. Neither recommendation was accepted. This was only one example of the general failure of the combined fleet midway plan to provide for adequate support of the Nagumo force. For air searches, the force would have to rely entirely on its own planes. To defend itself against air attack, it would have to depend largely on its own combat air patrol, because the force itself lacked enough screening units to throw up an effective barrage of anti-aircraft fire. Obviously, the battleship groups, which were to be deployed 300 miles behind the carrier forces, would be incapable of rendering any assistance in case the latter got into trouble. In fact, it was difficult for Nagumo's staff to see how the battleships, if disposed so far to the rear, would serve any useful purpose whatever in the overall operation. Basically, the trouble lay in the fact, pointed out earlier, that the Midway Plan rested on the obsolete concept, still dominant in combined fleet headquarters. That battleships rather than carriers constituted the main battle strength of the fleet. Instead of employing the battleships to screen and reinforce the carriers, it was the carriers which were placed in the supporting role. The fallacy of this concept was to be driven home with tragic force. A week before the war games of 1 to the 4th of May, the need of a thoroughgoing fleet reorganisation designed to place paramount emphasis on carrier air power rather than surface gun power had been strongly urged by Commander Gender. And other officers of the Nagumo Force at a conference held on board Yamato to review the first phase operations. Rear Admiral Yamaguchi had specifically proposed that the entire mobile surface strength of combined fleet be reorganised into three task fleets, each of which would have a nucleus of three or four carriers with adequate numbers of battleships, cruisers and destroyers to screen them. Combined fleet already had plenty of screening ships, and by the latter part of 1942 was also expected to have enough carriers to form three such task fleets. Two of them could be organised immediately, each well-balanced and with powerful carrier strength. Combined fleet agreed to this proposal in principle, but actually no action was taken to put it into effect prior to the midway operation. The war games and study conferences thus ended with many officers in the operational forces dissatisfied over various aspects of the midway plan and with numerous important problems left unsolved. Some officers privately whispered that combined fleet headquarters seemed seriously to underestimate enemy capabilities. None dared voice this accusation openly during the conferences, however, and to a considerable extent the operational commands themselves were guilty of overconfidence. This was certainly true of the Nagumo force. We were so sure of our own strength that we thought we could smash the enemy fleet single-handed, even if the battleship groups did nothing to support us. At the conclusion of the study conferences, Admiral Yamamoto called upon all combined fleet forces to devote their fullest energies to the successful prosecution of the forthcoming operations. He said in part, as a result of the smooth progress of the first phase operations, we have established an invincible strategic position. This position, however, cannot be maintained if we go on the defensive. In order to secure it tenaciously, we must keep on striking offensively at the enemy's weak points one after another. This will be the central aim of our second phase operations. Even while the midway operation was being studied and rehearsed, developments which were to influence it profoundly were taking place nearly 3,000 miles away on the northeastern approaches to Australia. There, Vice Admiral Shigeyoshi Inouye's 4th Fleet had launched the long-planned invasion moves toward Tulagi in the Solomons and Port Moresby in southeastern New Guinea, which on the 7th of May precipitated the Battle of the Coral Sea. As originally planned in January, the Tulagi and Port Moresby invasions were to have been carried out shortly after the occupation of Lao and Salamaua in early March.
However, the appearance in the southeast area of an American naval force estimated to consist of two fleet carriers, four heavy cruisers, four light cruisers, and more than a dozen destroyers, had led Combined Fleet to defer the operation until 4th Fleet could be reinforced with a carrier division from the Nagumo force and some additional heavy cruisers. These reinforcements, consisting mainly of Carrier Division 5, Zuikaku, Shokaku and Cruiser Division 5, Miyoko, Haguro, finally reached 4th Fleet's home base at Truk just before the end of April. In addition, Combined Fleet released the light carrier Shoho to 4th Fleet Command for the operations, since both Carrier Division 5 and Cruiser Division 5 were scheduled to take part in the later midway operation, Vice Admiral Inouye lost no time in getting started. His operational plan called for the seizure of Tulagi on the 3rd of May, with the main assault on Port Moresby to be carried out a week later. The invasion convoys, staging out of Rabul, were to be covered by two principal surface forces, one a close covering group composed of light carrier Shoho, four heavy cruisers and a destroyer, commanded by Rear Admiral Aritomo Goto. The other a carrier striking force made up of Zuikaku and Shokaku, the two heavy cruisers of Cruiser Division 5, and six destroyers, commanded by Vice Admiral Takeo Takagi. Under Takagi, carrier air operations were to be commanded by Rear Admiral Chuichi Hara, Commander Carrier Division. The two forces sorted from Truk on the 30th of April and the 1st of May respectively, the Tulagi landing was successfully carried out on the 3rd of May according to plan, and the next day the Port Moresby invasion force embarked from Rabaul in 14 transports escorted by one light cruiser and six destroyers. It had barely gotten underway, however, when enemy carrier aircraft delivered a severe attack on the Tulagi beachhead, sinking or damaging a number of small Japanese naval craft offshore. This gave warning of the presence of an enemy task force in the vicinity and Vice Admiral Takagi's carrier striking force, which was still some distance north of the Solomons, promptly headed south at high speed to locate and engage the enemy. The Port Moresby convoy, not yet in danger, continued on its way, closely covered by Rear Admiral Goto's force. By the morning of the 6th of May, the Takagi force had skirted around the southeastern extremity of the Solomons and entered the Coral Sea, but it was not until the next day that it finally made contact with the enemy. At dawn on the 7th, search planes were launched from the carriers, and shortly thereafter one of them radioed back that it had sighted an enemy task force, including one carrier, about 160 miles south of the Japanese position. The entire attack strength of Zuikaku and Shokaku, a total of 78 bombers, torpedo planes and fighters immediately took off to attack, but when they reached the reported enemy position, they found that the task force actually was only a large oiler escorted by a single destroyer. The two ships, later identified as Neosho and Sims, were subjected to a fierce attack, which sank the destroyer and left the oiler heavily damaged and afire, with its crew abandoning ship. Only a short while after the attack groups had taken off and headed for their objective. Rear Admiral Hara, commanding the air operations, received reports from search planes of the Goto force, strongly indicating that the earlier sighting report had been erroneous and placing the enemy carrier group to the southeast of the Louisiade archipelago. It was too late, however, to divert the attack and a precious opportunity to strike the first blow at the enemy carriers was lost. The failure proved costly for the Japanese forces, for while the Zuikaku and Shokaku air units were busy attacking Neosho and Sims, planes from the enemy carriers discovered a much more worthwhile target. Vice Admiral Inouye, commanding the overall Japanese operations from Rabaul, had already ordered the Port Moresby Transport Group to retire northward until the threat from the enemy carriers was eliminated. It was executing this order, covered by Rear Admiral Goto's force, when, at 11am on the 7th, a force of nearly 100 American bombers and torpedo planes spotted the covering group and delivered a fierce attack. The enemy aircraft concentrated almost entirely on light carrier Shoho, which was heavily hit, and went to the bottom at 11.35 a.m. By the time the attack groups of Zuikaku and Shokaku were ready to take off again, it was late afternoon and Rear Admiral Hara felt that it would be too risky to send his full strength against the enemy carriers, as the pilots would have to find their way back and land in darkness. Still, he was eager to strike as quickly as possible, and therefore decided to launch part of his strength for a dusk attack, 
using only picked crews trained in night operations. At 4.30pm, a force of 27 bombers and torpedo planes took off and headed for the enemy's estimated position. It failed, however, to spot the carriers, and instead had the misfortune to run into an enemy fighter patrol, losing several planes in the ensuing dogfight. The remaining planes turned back and, on their way, passed right over the enemy carriers without being able to attack because they had already jettisoned their bombs and torpedoes. Before dawn the next day, the 8th of May, the Takagi force again sent out float planes to look for the enemy, and at 8.24am they radioed back that they had spotted the American carrier group bearing 205 degrees, 235 miles from the Japanese force. The group was reported to include two carriers and one other large unit, probably a battleship. Zuikaku and Shokaku immediately launched their full attack strength, aggregating about 70 bombers and torpedo planes. At 11.20 a.m. the attack groups arrived over the target and began their assault against strong anti-aircraft fire and fighter opposition. The attack was highly effective, though not the total success that the reports of the returning flyers led Admirals Takagi and Hara to believe. According to these reports, both enemy carriers, one mistakenly identified as Saratoga, actually Lexington, and the other, correctly as Yorktown, had been sent to the bottom, and a battleship or cruiser had been damaged. The actual results, not known to the Japanese until much later, were that Lexington, though not sunk in the attack, was so heavily damaged that she had to be abandoned and finished off by torpedoes from her destroyer escort later the same day. While Yorktown sustained a single bomb hit, which, though it caused considerable damage, did not put her out of action. In the meantime, the Takagi force also underwent attack by the air groups of the American carriers. The enemy planes, which were on their way at the same time that Japanese planes headed for Lexington and Yorktown, appeared over the Takagi force at 10.50am and continued attacking until 12.20am. Zuikaku managed to elude the attack by heading into a rain squall which hid her from the enemy pilots, but Shokaku, absorbing the full fury of the assault, sustained three direct bomb hits which rendered her incapable of continuing flight operations. Consequently, Shokaku was ordered to withdraw, and Zuikaku had to recover the planes of both carriers. The tide of battle now appeared to have veered strongly in favour of the Japanese, for despite the loss of Shoho and damage to Shokaku, Zuikaku remained unharmed, whereas both of the American carriers were believed to have been eliminated. This seemed to present an excellent opportunity for the Takagi force to continue the offensive and complete the enemy's destruction. At about 5pm on the 8th, however, Vice Admiral Inouye at Rabul suddenly ordered the striking force to break off the action and retire, following this up a short while later with a further order postponing the Port Moresby invasion and directing the transport group to put back to Rabaul. The reason for the 4th Fleet Commander's decision apparently was his estimate that, although the American carrier group had been crushed, the carrier air strength remaining on the Japanese side was insufficient to protect the invasion force against land-based air assault. When reports of Admiral Inouye's action reached Combined Fleet Headquarters late on the 8th, Admiral Yamamoto, Highly displeased at Inouye's failure to exploit the advantage gained in the carrier battle of that morning, dispatched a strongly worded order to the 4th Fleet commander, directing that every effort be made to complete the destruction of the enemy force. Takagi was consequently ordered to head south again and re-establish contact, but two days of searching for the enemy proved fruitless, and his force finally retired from the battle area on the night of the 10th of May. A tally of Japanese losses in the Battle of the Coral Sea showed light carrier Shoho, destroyer Kikuzuki, and three small naval units sunk, carrier Shokaku damaged, some 77 planes lost, and a total of 1,074 men killed or wounded. On the other hand, actual losses inflicted on the enemy, as learned after the war, were carrier Lexington, Euler Neosho, and destroyer Sims sunk, carrier Yorktown damaged, 66 planes lost, and 543 killed or wounded. Thus, if the Coral Sea battle can be said to have been a Japanese victory, it was a victory only by the narrowest numerical margin, even without taking into account the thwarting of the Port Moresby invasion. Certainly, the actual outcome was a far cry from the sweeping triumph which was announced to the Japanese nation over the radio to the stirring accompaniment of the Navy march. 
Rather than upset the time schedule already fixed for later operations, Combined Fleet now decided on an indefinite postponement of the move against Port Moresby and ordered Carrier Division 5 and Cruiser Division 5 to return to the homeland immediately to prepare for the Midway invasion. On the 17th of May, Shokaku reached Kure, having the unenvied distinction of being the most heavily damaged Japanese warship to put in at that naval base since the beginning of hostilities. The fact that hits by only three medium bombs had rendered her incapable of flight operations was a striking lesson in carrier vulnerability. Furthermore, a survey of her damages showed that at least one month would be required to complete repairs, which meant that she could not participate in the midway operation. Carrier Division 5 flagship Zuikaku, which followed Shokaku into port a few days later, had escaped physical damage, but because of heavy losses of flying personnel, it was soon apparent that she also would not be available for the midway operation. Even if aircraft and aircrew replacements were promptly provided, only a week now remained before the sortie of the Nagumo force, and it would clearly be impossible to give the replacement personnel enough shipboard training to enable the carrier to function effectively in battle. Thus, the Coral Sea victory had far-reaching consequences for the midway operation, the elimination of Zuikaku and Shokaku deprived the Nagumo force of one-third of its airstriking power, possibly the margin that made the difference between victory and defeat. The unexpected exclusion of Carrier Division 5 from the Midway forces, however, did not diminish the optimism with which Combined Fleet Headquarters, or the Nagumo force for that matter, viewed the impending operation. As the two American carriers involved in the Coral Sea battle were both believed to have been sunk, the ratio of carrier strength available for the midway contest still appeared to be overwhelmingly in Japan's favour. The Nagumo force, with the battle-tested carriers Akagi, Kaga, Soryu and Hiryu still at its disposal, was fully confident of its ability to crush any enemy force that might be thrown against it. Even the naval general staff, which originally had opposed the midway venture as too risky, now seemed to have little apprehension regarding the outcome. These calculations were, of course, proven wrong by later events. Yorktown had not been sunk in the Coral Sea, nor was she even damaged badly enough to keep her from participating in the next battle. The full story, as it became known to the Japanese after the war, showed that Yorktown hastened back to Pearl Harbor, where repair crews, by working around the clock for two straight days, succeeded in making her ready for sea in time to join the forces sent to forestall the Midway invasion. This achievement was in striking contrast to our own lackadaisical effort, as a result of which neither Shokaku nor Zuikaku was able to participate in the midway operation. After the conclusion of the war games and staff conferences on board Yamato during the first week of May, the flagship weighed anchor and proceeded from Hashirajima to Kura in order to load supplies and effect minor repairs. The harbour of the naval base seethed with tremendous activity. Ships kept arriving and departing in a never-ending procession, and small craft plied incessantly between the shore and warships moored in the harbour, shuttling supplies. Although the beginning of summer was almost at hand, Ryujo and Junyo, the two carriers assigned to Vice Admiral Hosogaya's northern force, were conspicuously loading quantities of heavy winter clothing and equipment. It was easy for their crews, as well as personnel of the base, to guess that a part of the forces would be operating in Arctic waters. On the 18th of May, Colonel Kionao Ichiki, commander of the army detachment which was to participate in the midway landing, went on board Yamato with his staff to confer with Admiral Yamamoto and to be briefed on the operational plan. This virtually completed the briefing of all the participating forces, and on the 19th, Yamato returned to Hashirajima to make final sortie preparations. The next day, Admiral Yamamoto issued an order which finally fixed the tactical grouping of the fleet forces as already outlined. The order also contained an estimate of enemy strength in the Midway, Hawaii and Aleutians areas A. Midway area, about 24 patrol flying boats, 12 army bombers and 20 fighters. Several patrol boats stationed around Midway and a number of submarines evidently operating to the west of the island. Hawaii area, about 60 patrol flying boats, 100 army bombers and 200 fighters. Naval combat strength, two or three carriers, two or three escort carriers, four or five heavy cruisers, three or four light cruisers, 
about 30 destroyers and 25 submarines. Aleutians area, no enemy naval and air strength or important installations except at Dutch Harbour. Supplementing the above estimate, it was judged on the basis of Japanese intelligence that Midway was defended by a force of about 750 marines, abundantly equipped with coastal defence guns and anti-aircraft artillery. The air strength based on the island, it was estimated, could rapidly be reinforced from Hawaii and might possibly be doubled as soon as the Japanese intention to attack became known. Intelligence indicated that the enemy's flying boats were conducting regular day and night patrols over a semicircular arc westward of Midway to a distance of 600 miles. The combined fleet estimate of enemy carrier strength in the Hawaiian Islands was based principally on the calculation that Hornet and Enterprise, which were known to have been involved in the Tokyo raid of the 18th of April, were now back at Pearl Harbor. A possible third carrier was added to allow for the eventuality that one of the two carriers believed sunk in the Battle of the Coral Sea might have been only damaged and have succeeded in making it back to Hawaii, or that wasp, whose whereabouts was not known, might be in the Hawaiian area. Ranger was definitely believed to be operating in the Atlantic. Lexington, actually Saratoga, was believed to have been sunk by a Japanese submarine near Hawaii in January 1942, but there were subsequent reports that she had gotten back to the United States' west coast and was undergoing repairs. That was all the enemy's carrier strength, except for newly built escort carriers, a few of which were considered likely to be at Hawaii. These, however, because of their inferior speed, were not regarded as augmenting the enemy's effective strength for fleet combat. Despite the 20th of May estimate, there were some indications that the enemy might be caught with even fewer than the two or three carriers which combined fleet anticipated might be available in the Hawaiian area to oppose the Japanese invasion of Midway. On the 18th of May, a patrol plane of the South Seas Force had spotted an enemy task force with two carriers to the east of the Solomons, which suggested that Hornet and Enterprise had again sorted from Pearl Harbor to operate in the Southwest Pacific. This seemed to be confirmed by subsequent radio intelligence, indicating the presence of an enemy carrier force to the south of the Solomons, and also by a reported raid on Tulagi by enemy carrier planes, a short while later. Should this enemy force continue operating in the Solomons area, it appeared likely that the Americans would have virtually no carrier strength available at Hawaii to throw against the Midway invasion force. The invasion would then be easy, but the hope of luring the enemy fleet into decisive battle would be gone. May 20th also saw the departure from Yokosuka and Kura of the transport group, carrying the army and navy landing forces for Midway. The transports headed for the assembly point at Saipan, where they arrived on the 24th of May. Rear Admiral Takeo Kurita's support force of heavy cruisers simultaneously arriving at nearby Guam in preparation for covering the advance of the invasion convoy on Midway. Various units of Vice Admiral Hosogaya's northern force likewise began moving out of the western inland sea after the 20th, heading for Ominato, the staging point for the Aleutians invasion. Slowly the massive battle forces were getting into motion, Forces which were to proceed direct from the inland sea to the battle area still had a week to wait. Admiral Yamamoto decided not to let this time go to waste, and on the 21st of May, the main force, the Kondo force, and Vice Admiral Nagumo's first carrier striking force went out through Bungo Strait into the open sea, and for two days engaged in fleet manoeuvres the biggest undertaken since before the outbreak of war, and the last ever to be staged in the open sea by the Imperial Navy. On the 25th of May, back in Hashirajima Anchorage, the Midway and Aleutians operations were once more rehearsed in tabletop manoeuvres held on board Yamato. The assembled commanders and staff officers also listened to a detailed report of the Coral Sea battle given by Vice Admiral Takagi, who had commanded the Japanese force in that engagement. Now everything was ready for the big sortie. Force commanders and staff officers assembled at Hashirajima gathered on board Yamato and joined Admiral Yamamoto in toasting the success of the forthcoming operation with cups of sake bestowed by His Majesty the Emperor. The stage was now set for the launching of the Midway operation. At each of the three takeoff points Ominato on northern Honshu, Hashirajima in the western inland sea, and Saipan and Guam in the Marianas, the forces were poised and ready to head for their objectives. 
Rear Admiral Kakuji Kakuta's second carrier striking force, assigned to the Aleutians' prong of the offensive, was the first to sortie. Flying his flag in light carrier Ryujo, Kakuta took his force out of Ominato Harbour at noon on the 26th of May, transited Tsugaru Strait and set an easterly course across the northern Pacific. Late the same night, the force encountered a dense and seemingly endless fog, which made it difficult to keep formation, since not one of the ships was equipped with radar and strict radio silence was in force. Even so, the fog was not entirely unwelcome, for it lessened the danger of discovery by enemy submarines known to be lurking in the waters east of Hokkaido. For this, the officers and men were grateful, but at the same time they fervently hoped that the fog would be gone by the 4th of June, when the carriers were to launch their strike against Dutch Harbour. The following morning, the 27th of May, saw the departure of the Nagumo force from Hashirajima Anchorage. As stated earlier, the 21 ships of the force threaded their way through Bungo Strait at about noon, and by nightfall were well into the Pacific, forging southeastward in circular cruising disposition. There was no indication that we had been discovered by enemy submarines, and I turned in for the night with a comfortable feeling that all was going well. My own luck, however, was not to hold. I had barely dropped off to sleep when I was suddenly awakened by sharp abdominal pains. Commander Tamai, Akagi's chief surgeon, was quickly summoned, and after a careful examination he announced that it was appendicitis, and he would have to operate immediately. This was a hard blow for it meant that I would be a helpless spectator of the exciting events about to begin. I asked Tamai if he couldn't possibly treat me so that I could keep going for another ten days without an operation, but he was adamant. Commander Gender joined in urging me to follow the surgeon's advice. The appendectomy was performed that night as Akagi sped on her way, and I awoke early the next afternoon in the ship's sick bay to find the sharp pain of the night before reduced to a dull ache the aftermath of Tamai's surgery. A corpsman who came in to see how I was getting on told me that our noon position had been 430 miles south of Tokyo, and that we were now headed east. Meanwhile, the other forces were also sortieing according to plan. From Ominato, Vice Admiral Hosogaya's Northern Force main body and the Atu and Kiska invasion forces departed on the 28th. Far to the south, the transports carrying the Midway landing forces escorted by Rear Admiral Tanaka's light cruiser flagship, Jintsu, and 12 destroyers, together with seaplane carrier Chitosi, tender Kamikawa Maru and other units, sorted from Saipan during that same evening. In order to deceive any enemy submarines that might be lurking in the vicinity, the invasion convoy first took a westerly course and skirted around to the south of Tinian before heading eastward. Rear Admiral Kurita's support group of heavy cruisers sorted almost simultaneously from Guam and took a parallel course about 40 miles to the southwest of the invasion convoy. Last to sortie were the main body of the Midway Invasion Force under Vice Admiral Kondo and the main force under direct command of Admiral Yamamoto. Kondo's ships began moving out of Hashirajima during the early morning of the 29th of May. Light cruiser Yura and seven destroyers of Destroyer Squadron 4 leading the way. Followed by cruiser divisions 4, Atago, Chokai and 5, Mayoko, Haguro, Battleship Division 3, less its second section, Ye, Congo, light carrier Zuiho and one destroyer. Admiral Kondo flew his flag in heavy cruiser Atago. After passing through Bungo Strait, the force headed eastward. Admiral Yamamoto's main force of 32 ships sorted on the heels of the Kondo force. Light cruiser Sendai and 20 destroyers under Commander Destroyer Squadron 3. Rear Admiral Shintaro Hashimoto were in the van, followed by Cruiser Division 9. Light cruisers Kitakami and Oi under Rear Admiral Fukuji Kishi, Battleship Division 1, Yamato, Nagato, Mutsu directly under Admiral Yamamoto, and Battleship Division 2, Ise, Hyuga, Fuso, Yamashiro under Vice Admiral Takasu. Light carrier Hosho and one destroyer brought up the rear. It was five months since the battleship group had last sorted from home waters. Throughout the first phase operations in the southern area, it had remained in the inland sea training rigorously for what it hoped would be a major role in the anticipated decisive battle against the American fleet. The officers and men of the big battle wagons were still confident that their massive firepower would win the battle when it came. Now at last, it looked as if they were going to have their chance to prove it, and the morale of the crews was high.
The strength of the force was greater than ever by reason of the addition of Yamato, armed with the heaviest guns afloat, now making her maidens sortie. As the main force headed for Bungo Strait, destroyers patrolling outside the strait suddenly reported sighting two enemy submarines. Radio intelligence had also reported a total of six enemy submarines operating in waters close to the homeland, and four more operating to the northeast of Wake Island. Anti-submarine operations by surface units and planes from Kura Naval Base were immediately intensified, and all ships of the Kondo and Yamamoto forces were ordered to proceed under strict anti-submarine alert. Both forces passed through the danger area happily without mishap. After reaching the open sea, the main force shifted its cruising disposition, the battleships forming two parallel columns with Yamato, Nagato and Mutsu on the right, and Aisa, Hyuga, Fuso and Yamashiro on the left. Between the two columns, light carrier Hosho took position and engaged in launching and recovering anti-submarine patrol planes. Light cruiser Sendai and 20 destroyers formed a circular screen around the battleship group at a distance of 1,500 metres. Light cruisers Kitakami and Oi were stationed on the rear flanks, 10,000 metres apart, to guard against tracking enemy submarines. The force proceeded southeast at a speed of 18 knots, zigzagging at intervals of 5 to 10 minutes. As I lay in Akagi's sick bay convalescing from the operation I had undergone on the night of our sortie, my thoughts naturally centred on the momentous operation in which our fleet was engaged. I thought especially of the heavy burden of responsibility resting on the shoulders of our own commander, Admiral Nagumo, whose force was spearheading the attack. Would he measure up to this responsibility? My first acquaintance with Admiral Nagumo dated back to 1933. I was then a lieutenant and chief flying officer of heavy cruiser Maya, assigned to Cruiser Division 4, 2nd Fleet. Besides Maya, the division comprised flagship Chokai, Takao and Atago, Japan's newest heavy cruisers. Nagumo, then a captain, was commanding officer of Takao. My duties brought me into frequent contact with Captain Nagumo, a capable, intelligent and energetic officer, who was rated high among the many able captains in the fleet. He belonged to what Navy officers called the Red Brick Group. This meant that he had already served a tour of duty in the Navy Ministry. The curious designation coming from the fact that the Navy Ministry building was made of red brick. He had also served in the Naval General Staff, on the staff of Combined Fleet, and as an instructor at the Naval War College. His command of a heavy cruiser followed the normal course of promotion to flag rank. He would get a battleship the following year, and eventually would become a fleet commander. In the Combined Fleet tactical organisation prevailing at that time, the Second Fleet constituted the advance force. Consequently, the emphasis in our training was primarily on torpedo attacks and night engagements. Captain Nagumo, an expert in torpedo warfare, was the right man in the right place. As a junior officer whose job was simply to fly planes, I looked up to him with a feeling of awe and admiration because of the outstanding way he discharged his exacting duties. Every aspect of his leadership impressed me. His speeches at manoeuvre conferences were always logical and enlightening, and one could not help respecting his extraordinary ability. Candid, yet open-hearted and considerate, he was always willing to assist the younger officers. We held him in high esteem and placed complete confidence in him. At this time, sentiment in favour of abrogating the Washington Naval Limitation Treaty was rapidly mounting in the Navy. In our eyes, the attitude of the central authorities seemed weak-kneed, and Captain Nagumo was leading an active movement against it. He busily visited the commanding officers of other ships and urged them to join in pressing for early abrogation of the treaty. As a result of his efforts, a recommendation was drafted and after being signed by many officers, was forwarded to the central authorities through fleet headquarters as representing the opinion of the fleet. This particularly pleased the young officers who always favoured a firm policy, whatever it might be, my impressions of Captain Nagumo at that time convinced me that he would be a great naval leader. Our paths did not cross again until 1941, by which time Nagumo had risen to Vice Admiral in command of 1st Air Fleet. I was assigned as a wing leader on carrier Akagi. In the intervening years, Nagumo's reputation had continued to rise, especially during his command of Destroyer Squadron 1 as a Rear Admiral. 
Serving under him again revived my memories of seven years earlier, and I was happy to be a member of his command. It was not long, however, before I noted that Nagumo had changed, and I began to feel dissatisfied with his apparent conservatism and passiveness. It might have been because he was now commanding an air arm, which was not his specialty. Personally, he was as warm-hearted and sympathetic as ever, but his once vigorous fighting spirit seemed to be gone, and with it his stature as an outstanding naval leader. Instead, he seemed rather average, and I was suddenly aware of his increased age. In directing operations, he no longer seemed to take the initiative, and when plans were being developed, he most often merely approved the recommendations of his staff. Commander Gender, his operations officer, once summed up the situation to me in these words, whenever I draft a plan, it is approved almost without consideration. This might appear to make my job easier, but it doesn't. On the contrary, it is disquieting to see my own plans approved without any check from above and then issued as formal orders. I am self-confident, but not so self-confident that I don't realise that anyone can make mistakes. Often I am puzzled over how to resolve an important problem. When I consider that a stroke of my pen might sway the destiny of the nation, it almost paralyses me with fear. If I were serving under a commander like Admiral Onishi or Admiral Yamaguchi, my plans would be thoroughly studied from every possible angle and returned to me with comments and opinions. I would then feel more sure and more free to propose ideas that might be extreme. I understood exactly what gender meant and was in complete sympathy with him. Unfortunately, such passiveness was not peculiar to Nagumo alone. It was a common failing in the Japanese Navy. Fleet commanders generally were inclined to leave all details to their staffs and content themselves with controlling only the broad outline of affairs. Thus, the personality of the commander was rarely reflected in the execution of operations. This tendency to rely excessively on the staff was promoted by the fact that, under the Japanese Navy system, officers whose seniority put them in line for a fleet command were often given one for which their special qualifications did not suit them. The appointment of Nagumo, whose specialty was torpedo warfare, to command the first air fleet was an example. A commander's shortcomings in special fields were supposed to be compensated for by the specialists on his staff. The result was that the influence of the staff officers naturally became very great. This did not mean, however, that staff officers trespassed on the authority of their superiors. Final responsibility for an operation always rested with the commander, and every action was presumed to have been taken by his decision. Indeed, Nagumo, passive though he was, did not always leave everything to his subordinates. There were occasions when he disregarded their advice and chose his own course of action. The end of the 29th of May found the various Japanese forces forging ahead toward their objectives without any hitch other than the fog still plaguing the Kakuta force. On the 30th, however, the weather also began to deteriorate over that part of the Central Pacific, now being traversed by the Yamamoto and Kondo forces. In the afternoon, the Yamamoto force encountered rain and increasingly strong winds, which caused the destroyers and cruisers to ship occasional seas over their bows, making navigation difficult. The formation cut its speed to 14 knots, and zigzagging was discontinued. It was not only the weather that was ominous. Yamato's radio crew, which was keeping a close watch on enemy communications traffic, intercepted a long, urgent message sent by an enemy submarine from a position directly ahead of the Japanese transport group. The message was addressed to Midway, it was in code, and we could not decipher it, but it suggested the possibility that the transport group had been discovered. If so, it would be logical for the enemy to surmise that the transports were almost certainly heading for Midway to attempt an invasion. Since so large a convoy sailing east-northeast from Saipan could hardly be taken as merely a supply force going to Wake Island, Admiral Yamamoto's staff officers, however, were not greatly concerned. They nonchalantly took the view that if the enemy had guessed our purpose and now sent his fleet out to oppose the invasion, the primary Japanese objective of drawing out the enemy forces to be destroyed in decisive battle would be achieved. Bad weather continued in the Central Pacific on the 31st of May. Not only the Yamamoto and Kondo forces, but also Vice Admiral Nagumo's carriers, which were a few hundred miles farther east, encountered strong winds and occasional rain. 
Meanwhile, Yamato's radio intelligence unit observed further signs of enemy activity, especially of aircraft and submarines, in both the Hawaii and Aleutians' vicinities. Admiral Yamamoto and his staff surmised that the activity around Hawaii might presage a sortie by an enemy task force, and they waited eagerly for reports of the flying boat reconnaissance, which was to have been carried out over Hawaii on this date. The two Type II flying boats assigned to this mission, designated the 2nd Operation K, had duly moved up to Watya, and were scheduled to take off at 12 a.m. May 30th, Tokyo time to reach French frigate Shoals by 2.30 p.m., 5.30 p.m. local time shortly before sunset, refuel there from submarines and take off within an hour and a half for Hawaii. If all went well, they would arrive over Hawaii at 8.45 p.m., 1.15 a.m. May 31st, local time. After completing their reconnaissance, they would fly non-stop back to Watya, reaching there about 9.20 a.m. Tokyo time on the 1st of June. Vice Admiral Komatsu, Commander Submarine Force, had assigned six submarines to the operation. Three of them were to refuel the flying boats at French Frigate Shoals. Another was to take station on a line between Watya and French Frigate Shoals, about 550 miles from the latter, to serve as a radio picket ship. The fifth was to lie off Keyhole Point, on the island of Hawaii, as a rescue boat in case of mishap, and the sixth was to be stationed 80 miles southwest of Oahu for patrol and weather observation. The carefully laid plan, however, had already gone awry. On the 30th of May, I-123, one of the fueling subs, reached French frigate Shoals and, to its dismay, found two enemy ships lying at anchor. It urgently radioed this information back to Quayaline, adding that there appeared to be little prospect of carrying out the refueling operation at the Shoals as planned. Vice Admiral Goto, 24th Air Flotilla Commander at Kwajalein, who was responsible for directing the second Operation K, accordingly ordered a 24-hour postponement, instructing I-123 to keep watching the shoals in the hope that the enemy ships would depart. This forlorn hope was blasted the following day, when I-123 reported that she had sighted two enemy flying boats near the entrance to the shoals. This made it apparent that the enemy was already using the shoals as a seaplane base, and there consequently was no alternative to complete abandonment of Operation K. These disappointing developments were promptly communicated to Admiral Yamamoto in Yamato. The failure of Operation K meant that there was no way of ascertaining what enemy strength actually was present at Pearl Harbor. Nevertheless, Combined fleet headquarters still hoped that, if an enemy force did sortie from that base, to oppose the Midway invasion. The submarine cordons, scheduled to be established by Vice Admiral Komatsu's command between Hawaii and Midway by the 2nd of June, would suffice to provide advance warning, as well as knowledge of the enemy's strength. The 1st of June found the Yamamoto force still surrounded by dark, forbidding weather, although the rain had ceased. Low-lying clouds made visibility so poor that it was barely possible from Yamato's bridge to make out the phantom shapes of the destroyer screen 1,500 metres away. It was now time for the main force to rendezvous with its tanker train and refuel. The oilers were not found at the pre-arranged rendezvous point, however, and Hosho launched planes to look for them. The search proved unsuccessful because of poor visibility, but at this point the tanker train radioed its position to Yamato making it possible to effect a rendezvous. At the same time, because radio silence had been broken, it had to be assumed that the enemy was now aware of the position of the main force. Evidence that the enemy had already discovered, or at the very least, strongly suspected the Japanese advance toward Midway mounted sharply during the day. Radio intelligence disclosed a marked intensification of communications traffic out of Hawaii, and 72 out of 180 intercepted messages were urgent, indicating an unusually tense situation. A chance encounter 500 miles north-northeast of Watya between a Japanese patrol plane from that island and an American flying boat, which exchanged brief machine gun bursts, also showed that the enemy had extended his midway-based air patrols out to a radius of 700 miles. There were still further reports to the effect that enemy submarines had been sighted about 500 miles northeast and north-northeast of Wake Island, which almost certainly indicated the existence of an American submarine patrol line some 600 miles southwest of Midway. 
By this time, the Midway transport convoy had reached a point about 1,000 miles to the west of Midway and was proceeding on a northeast course. Advancing at a rate of 240 miles in 24 hours, the convoy would enter the 700-mile patrol radius of American planes from Midway on the 3rd of June, two days before the date set for the pre-invasion airstrike on the island by the Nagumo force. It looked as if the transports were advancing too fast for their own safety. Cloudy weather, with occasional rain, persisted in the vicinity of the Yamamoto force on the 2nd of June. Fueling operations, which had started the preceding day after the delayed rendezvous with the tankers, were resumed in the morning but had to be discontinued again when visibility became so poor that the ships could no longer manoeuvre safely. Still another hitch now developed in the operation plan. Owing to overhaul delays which had postponed their departure from the homeland, the submarines of Squadron 5 assigned to the B Cordon Line scheduled to be established on the 2nd of June to the northwest of Hawaii failed to reach their assigned positions. Boats of Submarine Squadron 3 assigned to the A Cordon Line to the west of Hawaii were also unable to reach their stations because of delays resulting from the miscarriage of Operation K. Actually, it was not until the 4th of June that the submarines arrived on station. With the submarine cordons not yet established, Admiral Yamamoto and his staff remained completely in the dark regarding enemy task force activities. During the 2nd of June, however, submarine I-168, reconnoitering the Midway area, sent in a few bits of information regarding the situation there. The report stated that no ships had been observed other than a picket ship south of Sand Island, that the enemy appeared to be flying intensive air patrols to the southwest, probably to a distance of 600 miles, that a strict alert seemed to be in force, with numerous aircraft on defensive patrol day and night, and that many construction cranes were visible on the island, suggesting that installations were being expanded. This turned out to be the only significant reconnaissance report sent in by a submarine during the Midway operation, despite the great reliance placed on them by combined fleet headquarters. During the second, the Nagumo force, cruising some 600 miles ahead of the Yamamoto force, entered an area enveloped in thick mist. Clouds hovered low over the ocean, and light rain began to fall. Fog seemed likely to follow. Already visibility was so restricted that neighbouring ships in the formation could scarcely see each other. Vice Admiral Nagumo in flagship Akagi was as much in the dark about enemy fleet movements and intentions as combined fleet headquarters. Indeed, because of Akagi's limited radio receiving capacity, coupled with the radio silence being observed by the advancing Japanese forces. He lacked much of the information which had been received by Admiral Yamamoto in the fleet flagship and which strongly suggested that the enemy was already aware or highly suspicious of a Japanese advance toward Midway and was preparing to counter it. This was precisely the situation which Rear Admiral Kusaka, Nagumo Force Chief of Staff, had feared might develop. Prior to the sortie, he had repeatedly requested that Yamato relay all important radio intelligence information to Akagi, but it was apparent that Admiral Yamamoto and his staff still hoped that surprise had not been lost and felt it advisable to continue radio silence. Thus, as the 2nd of June ended, the Japanese forces were steadily approaching their objectives through adverse weather. Thus far, there was no certain indication that any of them had actually been detected by the enemy, and every man from Commander-in-Chief Combined Fleet on down hoped that the precious advantage of surprise was still in Japanese hands. By dawn on the 3rd of June, the mist which the Nagumo force had encountered the previous afternoon had become a heavy blanket of fog. Steaming at fog navigation quarters, adjoining ships in the formation were often unable to see each other across their scant 600-yard intervals. Powerful searchlights were turned on, but they scarcely showed through the gloom. The task of maintaining zigzag courses through this endless veil, with only momentary and infrequent glimpses of consorting ships, was arduous and nerve-wracking. Yet it had to be done, for we were entering waters patrolled by enemy submarines. While the fog was advantageous in keeping us hidden from prying scout planes, this benefit was cancelled by the increased hazards of navigation. Moreover, the fog would not hamper the enemy's radar-equipped submarines, yet it prevented us from launching anti-submarine patrol planes. To cope with these and other problems that beset us, all ships were at full alert, 
and double watches were posted at submarine lookout stations. The starboard side of Akagi's bridge was occupied by Admiral Nagumo and his entire staff. They stared silently at the impenetrable curtain surrounding the ship, and each face was tense with anxiety. Captain Aoki and his navigation officer, Commander Miura, on the other side of the bridge, devoted their entire energies to keeping the ship on course and maintaining position in the formation. From time to time they leaned out of the window in an effort to peer through the all-encompassing fog.